And um, let me begin with um, thanking all of you to come for uh, this session and an afternoon 2.30. Not an exciting proposition to come and talk about um, multilateralism, sustainable development, peace, things like that. Before I get into, um, uh, let me make some uh, preliminary observation. Uh, we don't see very many universities talk about peace. And probably I must acknowledge that um, a university by name dedicated to world peace, even though this university is known for um, engineering and um, other hardcore subjects. So probably, I mean, many people say that in India, m many of the universities won't even think about naming the university as a world peace university. So I acknowledge that. And the second, when we suggested that you know, on behalf of the management, um, Professor Haridas was happy to take it up. This is also an important um, sign. And why it is? Because universities are the custodians of ideas. And one of the, the task of the universities is being a custodian and take it forward those ideas, facilitate those ideas. And when you talk about ideas, Practically almost all the ideas are welcome for debate and discussion. And in today's context, university's function of acting as a custodian of all ideas are in somewhat, I would say that, um, challenge. On a national level, global level, so universities are most often shy away from being a custodian of ideas. So from that context, let me acknowledge that this is an important initiative. And this today, the International Day for Multilateralism and Diplomacy for Peace, and this is the first ever day dedicated to this particular event. There is International Day dedicated for peace, but looking at um, uh, diplomacy and multilateralism uh, for building peace is, this is the first time. And today at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, they are having a special one day session on the theme of today. And um, so probably that's also important. We are at par with any other global development. Probably in India, we are the only university maybe even thinking about and looking at this issue. So we are talking about um, three major issues. And um, the, one of the major symbol of multilateralism is United Nations. It's almost 74 years ago, United Nations formed as a major initiative towards creating multilateralism. And today, multilateralism is, we'll have a detailed discussion about it. These are some um, initial thoughts to get into our, our debate. Multilateralism is becoming an important tool for solving many of the bilateral issues. Bilateral issues between, between two countries, if there's a problem, how do you solve it? War and aggression is, it's a, it's a character of a primitive human beings. And evolved human beings deal with issues in evolved way. And one of the evolutionary step is we have many ways to deal with an idea level or an institution level, and we create new institutions to solve problems. So multilateralism is diplomacy. This is the context in which we had to understand the importance of it. And to, there are three objectives of today why we are hosting this day. One is to means the promotion, promotion of the values of United Nations. United Nations stands for the ideas of multilateralism and also solving problems in a multilateral way. And India is one of the major member from the day one India is on the United Nations. So India, was, India got a permanent, uh, a significantly large diplomatic community based in New York to represent many of the UN forums. And also reaffirm that the United Nations Charter. Charter is one of the basic premises of the Charter is ensuring human rights for each and everybody. And the third is about today is committed, today is the day for highlighting the importance of multilateralism. And in the context, the international law. And the last and final one is about the, the common goal of lasting sustainable peace through diplomacy. When you talk about peace, you should have a plan for peace. We have an institution for a peace, but also we have to talk about peace local level, regional level, national level, and international level. Most of my reflection is mostly on the global international level, how we work towards uh, creating sustainable peace, and also what are the institutions which we're creating, how to use those institutions. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> right. So my subject is Sustainable Development Goal and the Scope of Building Peace Through Multilateralism and Diplomacy. And uh, my presentation will have um, some introductory remarks. Then I'll briefly look at what are the impediments of building peace. And I'll just focus more on Sustainable Development Goal because that is my area of um, subject. I have a special reason why I'm interested in sub Sustainable Development Goal. I'll, I'll come to that. Then building peace through Sustainable Development Goal. Sustainable Development Goal 16 is specifically dedicated to building peace and institutions of peace. And uh, multilateralism, I'll not touch upon that because my colleague is speaking on multilateralism extensively. And uh, diplomacy, peace building, and especially in the context of SDG 17. SDG 17 is about a partnership for implementing Sustainable Development Goal and um, concluding notes. So this will be the outline of my presentation. And I've been told that I, sh I have 15 minutes, probably little more because I have 21 slides. I may take maybe um, one minute, less than one minute for one slide. So it could be about the 20 minutes. So, so and my presentation again, I look at these four concepts. What is sustainable development goal? What is multilateralism? what is peace building institutions, and also what is diplomacy, and how these are interconnected. So that is my major area of discourse I wanted to engage with you, how these are interconnected, and why that is important for us. So before I get into I'll just focus on the issue of, when you talk about peace building, we should know what are the impediments of building peace, what are the barriers of building peace. And peace also, peace building also we have to understand in the local, regional, national, and global level. If you look at global level, one of the biggest barriers to building peace is inconsolable level of violence, iniquity, and, and iniquity, and, and also the violence, if you unpack the violence, we are talking about interpersonal violence, gender-based violence, sexual violence, intergenerational generational violence, ethnic violence, and inter-country violence. So we are talking about extensively large context of violence. And we could say that we live in a society where violence is one of the dominant mode of expression. Maybe violent, violence is one of the dominant mode of um, solving problems. So this we have to understand. This is a context in which we're working about, we are talking about uh, building peace. Because there is one of the criticisms about peace studies is that they are forgetting about um, the political context of peace building and the, the, the impediments of peace building. And we are living in an extremely unequal, inequitable society, and how do you build peace in that, in the context of inequity. And also there are deep-seated structural violence. We structurally eliminate, exclude people from the benefits of development. That structural violence itself is a major impediment of peace building, and also lack of institutional mechanisms to, to solve problems. For example, legal systems are not necessarily accessible and, uh, and for the people to solve their own problem. Even when legal systems are available, they are an excruciating slow process. So the delayed justice is denied justice. So legal systems are almost um, limited to problem solving on a day-to-day -day level. This is also due to its extensive level of um, peace and also, I mean, uh, as an impediment of peace building. And also, we, we are living in a, uh, in a situation where violence is glorified. Violence is publicly justified, and violence is, as, as a part of manliness, violence is part of political discourse. But we don't have a space for challenging and creating a counter-argument about why violence is not the right way to go about it. This is not a soft way of doing politics. It's, this is a hard way of doing politics. Hard way of doing politics is uh, doing smart way of po doing politics. You're creating institution, creating space for discussing about, um, about, viol about creating peace. And also in, in, the, in the overall, there are limited space and forum for developing a peace discourse. You don't see on a day-to-day -day basis a detailed debate about a dis a peace. Peace is considered as, uh, as a, a Gandhian thought or very soft political option. But I won't agree to that. These are hardcore emerging challenges of the world. And we also have um, examples from various other countries about uh, how peace is built, uh, being built and new institutions are being created. And I just want to introduce Sustainable Development Goal. 
I would say that SDGs as one of the major contribution of the bilateralism. Sustainable Development World was unilaterally, uniformly agreed by United Nations General Assembly in 19, uh, about uh, three years ago. And um, I was uh, privileged enough to be at the General Assembly when the, uh, an Indian Prime Minister endorsed in General uh, SDGs. And I had opportunity to speak at the General Assembly. And also I was extensively part of the various discussion at the region level, global level, creating indicators and the targets for sustainable development. So this is what I mentioned that I have a very personal uh, concern and a commitment towards SDGs. And these details are in the next slide if anybody is interested. Next slide. And also, I just wanted to mention about um, the genesis of Sustainable Development Goal. Those who are familiar with um, the development go discourse globally, the SDGs are the graduate, the postgraduate level from the MDGs. Millennium Development Goal for eight Millennium Development Goal, and from 2000 to 2015. And um, MDGs, if you compare and contrast between MDGs and SDGs, MDGs had a, a clear financial commitment of 0.7% of the GNP, gross national product was supposed to be given by developed countries and developing countries towards implementing MDGs. And also, if you look at SDGs, there is no specific financial allocation. And this is also an important issue about when you talk about peace building, because unless you have financial allocation for implementing sustainable development goal, these are all remain as a cliche. This is one of the major limitations of that. And again, when you look at the success of MDGs were mixed. The um, maternal mortality rate was significantly reduced in many countries, but at the same time, when you're talking about when one lakh uh, mothers um, give birth to a child, 800 mothers die in many countries. India, it's um, 60 mothers die every, every one lakh childbirth. But in some states, it's reduced to 40, but in some other states, it can go up to 80. Within the country, there are variations. But in a country like Afghanistan, you can expect about 800 mothers will die when one lakh mothers give birth to a child. This is not because we don't have technical in, uh, capacity. This is not because of we don't know how to do with that. This is purely an issue of political will. And this is also not resources. And I personally did extensive study on the reasons of maternal mortality, infant mortality, what are the causes of that. What we call it as we do verbal autopsy. After the death, we look into that. Then we computed how much money might have saved one mother from dying. And we're talking about 200 rupees, 250 rupees. It's not a technical or medical knowledge. It's other factors. They didn't manage to go to hospital. They didn't know what's the date of delivery. Or they didn't know the, when they went to the doctor, they said, you come back tomorrow because that's a tribal girl. So there are various social factors. But this also you had to understand. These are the, the peace building impediments in the local level and national level. And also when you talk about um, um, the, the difference between SDG and MDG, there's one more factor I want to suggest that. Sustainable Millennium Development Goal was mostly created as a bureaucratic endeavor. And it's created by the heads of some of the top experts from the United Nations. They sat together. They created eight sustainable uh, Millennium Development Goal. But SDGs are extensively consulted. Almost five years there is extensive con consultation on national level, international level. But you may not have seen at the, at the grassroots level, you may not have seen much discussion at the, at the university level, at the panchayat level, at the, the, at the corporation level. So this is one of the, another important issue, you have, to, you have to remember that. And, um, and also when you, when you talk about SDG, and if anybody's interested about, again, further the genesis of uh, how SDG MDGs came, you have to go back about 25 years ago. There is an international conference on um, uh, um, population development, ICPD, in Cairo. And they created 126 indicators for national global development. Because it's too huge endeavor, it's the first time any United Nations agencies managed to come out with a consensus statement of uh, 126 indicators, uh, goals as um, global development. But somehow it was too big for the people to catch the imagination of the international community. So the success of the ICPD is, is, uh, is varying. That's the reason MDG came. And because MDG didn't achieve the goals by 2015, and 2015, the international community declared sustainable development goal. And um, we are talking about 17 goals, 169 targets, 
and 230 indicators. It's quite a basket full. And uh, one of the strength is that most of the issues are covered into that. And, and also that's one of the limitations. You're talking about 100 and almost 230 um, indicators to measure sustainable development goal. But when you try to unpack this, many of the countries, they don't have enough data to look at it. When you looked at India, we have about 50 sets of targets, data for 50 sets of targets. So this is another issue. But within that, there is a variation between 1 to, six, 1 to 17. Some are very strong, some are very weak. And sustainable development goal generally talk about poverty, hunger, health, education, climatic change, gender equality, social justice and peace. So these are the issues covered under sustainable development goal. So the authors of sustainable development goal was very clear about the role of peace building as an important step towards sustainable development goal. Or without sustainable peace, there is no sustainable development. Or without sustainable development goal, there is no sustainable peace. These are two-way interaction. So this is an important aspect that this is connected in, in both ways. And also the, go the, the goals are time-bound. We have to achieve by year 2030. There are detailed roadmap towards sustainable development, and also there are detailed roadmap towards how to build peace globally. But when you lo look at the cost of financing sustainable development goal, very few countries did a costing of what is the cost of implementing sustainable development in, in, each, in their own countries. Even the heads of the governments approved, appreciated, endorsed sustainable development goal, that discourse, discourse was not followed up at the national level in many countries. So this is another major reason we have to remember that. We are just going through, we are just finishing the election, and I had a curiosity to look at how much sustainable development goals are reflected in the manifestos of the parties. And remember that all, all the, most of the political leaders are at the UN General Assembly to endorse sustainable development goal. These are legally binding for the national government when they endorse it. Or we have a moral obligation, legal obligation to follow sustainable development goal. So ideally this should have reflected in the, in the, in the, in the election manifestos. I'm not getting into the detail why it didn't happen and what is the consequence of this. And let me just also highlight when you talked about sustainable development goal, what is the cost of implementing sustainable development goal? And um, initially, the MDGs, we talked about billions. But sustainable development goal, we, we replaced B with T. We're talking about trillion dollars. So this is the magnitude we're talking about. But this is the magnitude we are, we are facing day-to-day -day realities of the national life, international life, and bilateral relationship between these countries. It's an expensive proposition. But alternative is more expensive than not investing in those areas. But in some agencies, they estimated each and one by one, they took and they looked at what is the cost of implementing SDGs. For example, SDG 3 is about health. So United Nations, different specialist agencies, they were assigned as a custodian of SDGs. SDG 3 is about health, health for all, and universal access to health care by 2030. And World Health Organization is a custodian of this. So they did an estimation. According to them, 134 to 171 billion for a year to implement the goals of sustainable development means universal access to health care for everybody. Just give an example about it. So this also the, it gives a magnitude of the challenges we're talking about. And um, again, let me just look into the issue of peace building. Sustainable Development Goal 16 is, ab is about specifically on peace, justice, and strong institutions. And this has got 12 targets and uh, 23 indicators. There's a clear roadmap towards how to build peace and how to build institutions and how, how to strengthen the institutions for building peace at the UN General Assembly approved roadmap towards Sustainable Development Goal. The target number one, 16.1, reduce violence everywhere. That's one of the targets. And the definition of reduce violence everywhere is significantly reduce all forms of violence and related death rates everywhere. So this is one of the clear definitions, what state policies, policies and programs could be in place to ensure that violence is reduced everywhere. And um, target number two is protect children from abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and violence. The definition is end abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against torture of children. 
and I'll just highlight one of the issue from that. Sexual violence against young men and women indicator 16.2.3, the proportion of young women and men aged 18 to 29 years who experience sexual violence by the age of 18. So this indicator. India, they, they report about 16% of the youngsters of that age group, they experience violence at some form or other. Target number three, promote the role of law and ensure equal access to justice. The definition is promote the role of law at the national and international level and ensure equal access to justice to all. Probably this is one of the major areas of our drawback. Our institutions are overburdened. Our institutions are overloaded with uh, case, cases. That means we are not investing enough to deal with the um, cases or we are not creating alternative institutions for um, problem solving uh, such as maybe arbitration and also local level uh, conflict resolution process. So creating new institutions of dealing with um, the conflict and injustice. So that is not happening. We, we rely more on the, the, the legal systems of the hardcore, the mainstream legal systems. We didn't manage to create alternative forms of uh, conflict resolution, legal resolutions to the extent which may require to solve the problems on a, on a large level. And also the next one we're talking about the combating organized crime and illicit financial and arms flow. The definition is by 2030 significantly reduce illicit financial and arms flow, strengthen the recovery and return of stolen assets and combat all for, form of organized crime. This particular target is today very important because three days ago, there is a, our neighborhood, there is a huge bomb blast, 230 people died. This is clearly linked with the lack of institutional mechanism to, to preempt such kind of violence, monitor such kind of violence, and also technological expansion to how to deal with those kind of issues before it happens. So this is very relevant for the, what we talked about, the, the roadmap which suggested by the United Nations. And um, the target number 16, and I didn't get into the details, I skip few. Strengthening the national institutions to prevent violence and combat crime and terrorism. The definition is strengthen the relevant national institutions, including through international cooperation for building capacity at all levels, in particular developing countries, to prevent violence and combat terrorism and crime. This is precisely what we are talking about, the, the Sri Lankan experience. So how do we create institutions to deal with such violence on a massive level, because this is also a huge manifestation of lack of failure of the state to protect the citizens and their institutions. And so this will be increasingly a challenge on particularly developing countries. And a few years, so India is not, um, uh, I mean, we know the experience in Indian context, we know the, our, our South Asian context, Bangladesh, they recently went through the serious violence. So violence, again, I would suggest that uh, it's one of the common, uh, part of the common discourse but we can't let it go. We need to find out institutions. We need to find out an alternative discourse. So that's the importance of our discussion about uh, peace building. And also the next slide is about, um, we are talking about the cost of violence. Violence is not neutral. It's not cost ne neutral. Last year, the world cost of violence was 14.3 trillion. The violence is not a, a value neutral thing. The violence is not a, a cost neutral. War is not a value neutral. So these are the huge financial burden on, on developing societies, the war and as well as, um, as the violence. And also, next let me move into the issue of multilateralism, which I'll not elaborate because one of our colleagues is speaking about it. But I just wanted to uh, just highlight three points. One is, today, the need for building multilateralism is more important than and anywhere in the history of the Indian civilization. And also, strengthening the multilateral institution. The multilateral refers an alliance of multiple countries pursuing a common goal or solving a common problem. Sorry? Yeah, I'll cover it so I'm not getting into the details of that. And also there are global challenges of multilateral, also my colleague is uh, talking about it. So I'll just keep, but I'm just highlighting that this is a time to invest time, attention, resources for building multilateral. So that's the point I want to build up. And also, I just want to build up this in the context of SDG 17. The diplomacy and the multilateralism has got a, a dedicated development goal that is about a sustainable development goal 17. The diplomacy for peace is an activity or a skill of managing 
International relations for ensuring peace. United Nations is the foremost institution for building peace. How to use various sub-institutions of the United Nations for building peace is an important skill. And also it's an important uh, uh, a skill which, which, could be, which should be a mandatory form the statesmen for the, for the developing countries. How to use institutions, existing institutions, what institutions we can create for solving multilateral issues, and um, the bilateral issues multilaterally. When we talk about goal number 17, it's about um, strengthening the means of implementation and, and revitalizing global partnership for sustainable development. This has got 19 targets and um, 24 indicators. I'll just highlight some of the targets. There are three major targets, financial targets, technology targets, capacity building targets, sorry, and also trade targets. And the financing, I just highlight one, developed countries to implement, to achieve the target of 0 0.07 ODA, or gross national product to the developing countries, and uh, 0 0.2 ODA to the least developing countries. And this is an important thing. This is a global commitment, what they call it as Paris Declaration, agreed by the developed countries that they will finance global development to the tune of 0.7% of the GNP. So we are talking about the targets in SDG 17. So one is about global financing of the development. There is a globally agreed, uh, globally, uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a mandatory uh, part of the legal system so also many of the developing countries that the amount of money they should uh, invest in OD overseas development assistance. But OD is not a charity. OD is probably we could say that uh, this is the interest of the money taken by the developed countries, by the developing countries. For example, you take the case of, um, you say, Bangladesh is one of the poorest country. But they are the major producers of the textile. But if you look at it, some of the major five global chains of the textile chains, they are sustaining because of the work of the laborers from um, Bangladesh. If they call for a strike, probably major 15 uh, supermarkets will be in serious trouble. So this interlinkages. So when, so when they're returning something as overseas development assistance, it's not a charity. It's, a, it's a, 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 a fraction of the interest they should have paid. So this is the way we had to look at the ODA. Also, we had to remember that developed countries also becoming a, a, a development assistance providing countries. For example, India provides significant aid for other countries, which we may not know what's the magnitude of that. It's estimated that India is giving about $25 billion worth of aid to other developing countries. And even countries like in Nepal, Bangladesh also giving aid. For example, when the tsunami came, Bangladesh sent doctors. When there is an earthquake came, Indian doctors, Nepali doctors went to Nepal. But the cost of that doctor's salary may be very fraction. But when the US once sent a million dollar grant through two consultants, and India maybe sent about 20 doctors. So the value proposition varies if you look at a dollar as a common denominator to assess or measure this. Just to give some of the anomalies of when you look at um, the sustainable development that is financing issue. And also when you talk about SDG 17, the partnership is also there are systemic issues, systematic issues. There are the policy and institutional coherence. Many of the developing countries, one of the limitations is that lack of policy expert in looking at some of the global trade issues at the national level. For example, when we go for a trade negotiation, most often United Nations come with a, a huge expert consultants, probably 30, 40 people for each negotiation. Countries like India go with maybe two or three. And they are mostly from the foreign, um, from the diplomacy core. They are not necessarily expert in um, international trade relationship. And for example, specifically, we'll, let's talk about um, the IT sector and the pharmaceutical sector. IT sector is reasonably well organized. When they say that you know we B1 visa is rejected for the uh, for the IT company, they will say, okay, we will reduce that or we will increase it, provided you open up your pharmaceutical sector. You reduce the generic production, you stop the generic production, allow the, the patented market to open up. Since there is no expertise and the community and the local participation and no strengthened patient advocacy groups in India, quite often that's what we're going to lose. We may get IT, about a couple of hundred thousand IT visas more, but in that process what we're losing is our market for generic manufacturing of medicine and we pay, end up paying for them, for example, paracetamol.
paracetamol, we can have a, a trade name paracetamol, which we pay up to 25 rupees, whereas the actual cost of production is less than one rupee. Just give an example about it. But how do you deal with this kind of trade negotiation? Unless we strengthen the capacity, so this also linked with when you look at the peace building. How to use peace building through institutional mechanism, policy mechanism? Our capacities are very limited that way. So we, we need to have a conscious effort towards building institutions on a range of areas, including peace building. And also there are our expertise in creating multi-stakeholder partnership. We know we have many multi-stakeholder, um, multi-partnerships multi or multilateral mechanisms. So for example, SARC, Southeast Asia Regional Economic Cooperation, we have ASEAN Cooperation, then we have a um, BRICS network, we also have a new uh, development bank, and we have BRIC bank we're talking about. So, we, and also now recently they created BIMSTIC, uh, Bay of Bengal Economic Development Cooperation, so there are new institutions are created. But how do you use this institution for building peace? That expertise is very limited. Probably those expertise has to come from universities since they are the think, think tank, they are the custodians of ideas. So one of the function is about um, universities like this, building up expertise, building up expertise and specifically in the area of institution building, create a space for a discourse on the need for investing on institutions or building peace by working through the existing multilateral mechanisms and also creating new institutional mechanisms. See, for example, we talk about um, uh, different forms of diplomacy. Today we talk about health diplomacy. There are many countries that have health diplomats, ambassadors dedicated only for health related issues. United Nations they have, Japan they have, most of the Scandinavian countries they have. Health is becoming a new form of diplomacy. Similarly, population issues becoming a new form of diplomacy. We talk about population diplomacy. So probably we, are, we also look at created a, a discourse on peace diplomacy, strengthen the peace diplomacy. We have a, a legitimate heritage of peace building to Mahatma Gandhi's peace related mission. But these are not the old politics. These are the new meaning for those old politics. And this is some, the major message we are talking about today that we acknowledge that there are institutional mechanisms, multilateralism, there are diplomacy, there are sustainable development goals. These are all examples of peace building. And also we have to remember that there are experience of many countries for peace building. There are some countries they even decided not to have a, an active military anymore. There are countries, there are, there are different countries they ex experience that. It is not a fashion, but it's not a prominent thing. But when you talk about today, we need how we can live without military, how we can live without institutions of aggression. But when you look at, um, suppose we, we uh, fast forward today's history to 100 years forward, then we look back, and probably then the civilization will look at, they look at the, the folly of the human beings, the biggest blunder human civilization ever did is creating war and war-related institutions. So my conclusion is that peace is possible, and peace is possible, and, and the university has to play a major role in that, creating the, a space for a discourse about peace, looking at expertise in peace building, and also boldly saying that peace is a bold, I mean, it's a, it's a possible alternative. And also we have to invest time and attention for building institutions of peace, locally, regionally, internationally. This has to look at our, our bilateral agreement. This, we have to look at our, our own legal systems. And probably we have to look at, when we talk about the, as part of the Sustainable Development Goal, India has got a commitment to submit a report, progress report to the United Nations every year in September when UN General Assembly meets. In that report, probably universities should take a leadership in writing the UN report on sustainable development, particularly looking at um, uh, sustainable development goal like Peace Building 16, Partnership Building 17. So I hope this institution, this, pa this space may have that leadership, they may take the management, take the leadership, to submit a report on alternative report on sustainable development goal and how it is used for peace building, how it is um, created diplomacy and how sustainable development goal as a, an, 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 a symbol of creating peace through multilateralism. Thank you very much.